The status of women kicks off uh, today, the theme being achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs. Let's take you live there now. Yes, after the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we will return to the normal modalities of the Commission and hold the full session in person that we should once again experience the coming together of the entire CSW community to reaffirm our commitment to gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. However, the pandemic continues to co impose limitations on the conduct of intergovernmental meetings at the United Nations headquarters as well as on international travel. Due to these limitations, the Bureau has adapted the program of work to allow the session to be held in a hybrid format. We have endeavored to match a normal session to the extent possible, holding most meetings in person. It is our hope that the hybrid modality allows for a large number and variety of stakeholders to take part in the Commission's deliberations. For the next two weeks, the Commission will consider the priority theme, achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs. It will evaluate the progress in the implementation of agreed conclusions from its 61st session on women's economic empowerment in the changing world of work. In addition, the Commission will consider an emerging issue, namely harnessing COVID-19 recovery for gender equality and a sustainable future. Excellencies, dear friends, this year's priority theme could not have been more timely. As stated in the Secretary General's report, gender inequality coupled with climate change environmental degradation and disasters is the greatest sustainable development challenge of the present time. Environmental degradation and the negative impacts of climate change affects society as a whole, but particularly women and girls' poverty, health and livelihoods. These impacts are strongest on rural and indigenous women and girls, those in vulnerable and marginalized situations, and those in conflict settings. Despite feeling the disproportionate impacts from climate change, environmental crisis, and natural disasters, women are also agents of change. At all levels, women are taking action and leading response efforts. We need to use CSW 66 to agree on practical measures of enhancing women's leadership in all these areas. The agency of the current situation has been highlighted in the recent IPCC report on climate change, which states that climate change is hitting the world's most vulnerable hardest. It is thus critical that all policies programs and funding for effective natural resource management, disaster risk reduction, environmental governance, and climate action are gender responsive. In South Africa, we have made strides with gender responsive policies to address climate change, environmental crisis, and disaster risk reduction. Our national strategy towards gender mainstreaming in the environment sector ensures that the interests of women and girls are at the center of all our action. Our disaster management policy targets the active inclusion and participation of vulnerable communities, including female-headed households. Our national climate change response strategy addresses both mitigation and adapt adaptation and forms the basis for a long-term just transition to a climate-resilient 
and low carbon economy. And it recognizes the special role that women can play in this important area. Excellencies and dear friends, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action commits states to ensure that women and girls can exercise their full human rights and fundamental freedom safely and free from prejudice. Yet women and girls continue to be denied equal access to land and natural resources, finance, technology, knowledge, mobility, and other assets. This leaves them more vulnerable to the impacts of climate and environmental crises and disasters. Further, we should not allow natural disasters and environmental crises to create an environment where women are denied their sexual reproductive health rights. We should all take action to eradicate the scourge of gender-based violence all over the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has halted progress on gender equality and in some areas reversed hard-won gains. It has exacerbated inequalities and discriminatory norms and has led to increased gender-based violence against women and girls. The socio-economic fallout of the pandemic has compounded the impacts of climate and environmental crisis, leaving women and girls further behind. Women and girls across the world are looking up to the Commission as the leading intergovernmental body on gender equality and the empowerment of women for guidance. They expect strong action-oriented policy recommendations that put gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls at the center of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs. This year's Commission has an opportunity to advance global normative agenda and global consensus on the critical topic before it. That is key to achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We can only make this a reality by mobilizing all stakeholders across member states, UN entities, civil society, and all sectors. Excellencies, dear friends, as I conclude, I wish to pledge South Africa's support and solidarity with the women and girls in conflict areas, the women and girls of Ukraine, the women and girls of Palestine, of Yemen, of Western Sahara, and everywhere else where conflict continues to rage. I look forward to a fruitful and ambitious session with the end result of concrete actions which demonstrably impact the lives of all women and girls everywhere. I thank you. I now invite the Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, to address the Commission. Madame la Présidente, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs les représentants, chers amis, j'ai l'honneur de me joindre à vous en personne pour l'ouverture d'un des événements annuels les plus énergiques et les plus dynamiques du programme de travail des Nations Unies, la session annuelle de la Commission de la Condition de la Femme. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue. I welcome everyone here and online. This year's Commission on the Status of Women confronts one of the most urgent issues of our time, the unprecedented emergencies 
of the climate crisis, pollution, desertification, and biodiversity loss, coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact of new and ongoing conflicts have accelerated and intensified into widespread and interlinked crises that affect us all, but not equally. Everywhere, women and girls face the greatest threats and the deepest harm. Everywhere, women and girls are taking action to confront the climate and environmental crises. And everywhere, women and girls continue to be largely excluded from the rooms where decisions are taken. Women and girls living in small island nations, least developed countries, and places affected by conflict are impacted most of all. Women suffer when local natural resources, including food and water, come under threat and have fewer ways to adapt. The environmental crises and extreme weather, like droughts and floods, disproportionately affect the nutrition, incomes, and livelihoods of women farmers. There is increasing evidence that child marriage and exploitation are linked with the climate crisis. And when climate disasters strike, as they do with increasing frequency, research shows that women and children are up to 14 times more likely than men to die. Climate change is exacerbating conflicts around the world with women peace builders often on the front lines of sustaining peace, working to keep their families and communities going, even in the grip of interlocking crises. I am deeply alarmed by the increase in violence and threats against women, human rights defenders, and environmental activists. Distinguished delegates, compounding all these factors, gender discrimination means just a tiny proportion of landowners and leaders are women. Women's needs and interests are often ignored and pushed aside in policies and decisions about land use, pollution, conservation and climate action. Just one third of decision-making roles under the UNFCCC, Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement are occupied by women and only 15% of environment ministers are women. Around the world, only one-third of 192 national energy frameworks include gender considerations. And gender considerations are rarely taken into account in climate financing. This demonstrates once more that we live in a male-dominated world with a male-dominated culture. We are still living with the results of millennia of patriarchy that excludes women and prevents their voices from being heard. We cannot realize any of our goals without the contributions of all. And this is why everyone, including men and boys, should be working for women's rights and gender equality. Distinguished delegates, the Paris Agreement is essential to the rights of women and girls. Addressing biodiversity loss, land degradation and pollution are vital to creating lives of dignity for all on a healthy planet. But we will not get there without women's full and equal participation and leadership. Women and girls, leaders, are at the forefront of the climate and environmental movements. Women farmers and indigenous women are authorities on managing resources sustainably. Women policymakers are essential to plan a future that takes everyone's interests into account. Women economists are rejecting outdated male-centric models and metrics, putting equality and sustainability at the heart of their work. Women lawyers are speaking up for the vulnerable and taking on powerful business interests that threaten their livelihoods. Women scientists are bringing new perspectives to sustainability and renewable energy. And women and girl climate activists 
are standing up for everyone's rights to a livable climate now and for future generations. In every sphere, women's voices, rights and contributions are vital to build the sustainable economies and resilient societies of tomorrow. My first ever report on the links between the climate emergency and gender equality outlines concrete steps to put women and girls at the center of climate and environmental policy. Distinguished delegates, over the past two years, gender inequalities and injustices have been highlighted and exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Millions of women have been thrown out of work with a crashing impact on their economic and social rights. Millions more have been confronted with an impossible choice between earning an income or doing unpaid but essential care work. Millions of girls are out of school. Many may never return. Tackling these issues requires a united front, protecting hard-won gains on women's rights while investing in lifelong learning, health care, decent jobs and social protection for women and girls. Gender equality and women's rights must be at the heart of a renewed social contract that is fit for today's societies and economies. We are seeing a pushback on women's rights. We must push back on the pushback. And at the global level, my report on our common agenda proposes a rebalancing of power and resources through a new global deal. And gender equality is a prerequisite. The report proposes a new agenda for peace with the goal of reducing all forms of violence, including gender-based violence, and putting women and girls at the heart of security policy. I thank women civil society groups for your important contributions to our common agenda and encourage your continued support for the proposals. Meanwhile, the United Nations is working every day to support the participation and leadership of women at every stage of building and maintaining peace. We have reached, more than one year ago, gender parity at the level of the 190 senior leaders of the United Nations and the Secretary Generals and the Assistant Secretary Generals. Full gender parity. And we have full gender parity in the leadership of country teams, the resident coordinators. And this is essential to make the UN more able to represent all the people in the world. And my special envoys and special representatives are designing and supporting strategies for more inclusive peace processes. Gender advisors in our special political missions promote women's participation and ensure women's priorities as integral to all our political efforts. And we work closely with women's mediation networks in Africa, the Mediterranean and beyond. This is not only a matter of justice. Women's equal leadership and participation are vital to create peaceful, resilient communities and societies. We cannot separate the perilous state of peace in our world from long-standing structures of patriarchy and exclusion. And the war in the Ukraine is another clear demonstration of this affirmation. Distinguished delegates, the climate and environmental crisis, coupled with the ongoing economic and social fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic, are the defining issues of our time. Our collective response will chart our course for decades to come. To forge the sustainable future we need, women and girls must be front and center, leading the way. Your work in this commission is vital to that effort, and I wish you a successful meeting, and I thank you. All right, uh, that is uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, the UN uh, Secretary uh, General, speaking uh, there about uh, gender parity. We also heard from Matu Joyini, who's uh, South Africa's permanent representative uh, to the UN, talking about girls being really at uh, the center of uh, these programs that they are indeed uh, leading, uh, and talking about the uh, Paris Agreement uh, being crucial in addressing uh, the plight of uh, women. All right, let's have